Welcome back to The Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. This week, we're going to look at some of the effects space travel has on the human body and examine some of the ways that we can help protect human travelers to the moon and beyond. Later on in the show, we're going to talk with physician and two-time astronaut Dave Williams, as well as one of my favorite science writers anywhere, Elizabeth Howell. We're going to be discussing their upcoming book, Why Am I Taller? Now, since humans first traveled to space in 1961, we have been learning about how harsh environments beyond our home planet affect human beings. Now, this may come as a surprise to those of you who experience car sickness, but space sickness is also a thing. The vestibular organ deep inside our inner ears senses gravity and acceleration and sends these signals to the brain. The microgravity environments of space, however, play havoc with these signals, leading to space sickness. Now, faces also grow more rounded and swollen in space, creating nasal congestion even in people who did not normally experience such pain. Lucky them. Over time, bones and muscles weaken, making their return to home to Earth a challenge for travelers no longer used to normal gravity. Muscles, including the human heart, weakens over time. Travelers into the final frontier exercise regularly to combat this, this degradation. Degradation. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth. And we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we're going to talk with a real-life space doctor, astronaut, and physician Dave Williams. We're also going to welcome space journalist Elizabeth Howell from Space.com to the show. Now, we've had some technical problems with the audio track on this episode, so please bear with us. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we're delighted to have a fantastic pair of guests uh, first of all, we're welcoming Dave Williams to the show. He is a physician and astronaut who has flown into space twice and has spent 17 hours walking in space. How cool. And we're also going to be talking with one of my favorite science writers, Elizabeth Howell. She is a staff writer at space.com. If you ever get a chance to check her writings out, you should do it. Welcome to the show, both of you. Well, thanks very much for having us. Thanks for the warm welcome, James. Yeah, you're welcome, Elizabeth. Um, and so first, um, I want to start with you, Elizabeth. Can you just tell us a little bit about your new book with Dave, Why Am I Taller? Uh, and what brought it about and what makes it so interesting? Well, the advantage of getting to work with a space doctor, Dave, is that uh, you learn a lot of interesting things about the human body, both how it operates here on the ground and also here in space. And so you get a little bit taller in space. You can read our book to find out why, or maybe Dave can tell us because he's the expert. But really, that's what the book is. It's looking at all the weird and wonderful and interesting ways that the human body changes up there. And also importantly, some of those changes do reflect what we go through here on Earth, especially as we start to get older. Our bones and our muscles really change. Our uh, chances of uh, cancer might increase a little bit. And so 
basically the message we're trying to show is by studying this stuff in space, we can get a bit smarter about how to treat all kinds of populations on Earth, even those in remote areas. And Dave, do you have anything you wanted to add to that? Well, I think part of the idea behind this book is really to capture the imagination of everyone about the possibility of humans flying in space, going farther and staying longer, what happens to our bodies during that experience. It's been an amazing collaboration between Elizabeth and myself on this book, and then previously we wrote Leadership Moments from NASA together. It's been a lot of fun trying to bring our ideas to uh, everyone that's interested in the space program. And how did the book come about? What was the what was the origin story of this? Well, the origin story was uh, the global pandemic that gripped all of us uh, starting about two years ago. And so Dave and I suddenly found ourselves with a lot of time on our calendars. And we had connected on another book of mine called Canada Arm in Collaboration, which is about the Canadian space program and about all the international connections that we forged as a part of that. So my goal in that book was to talk to just about every Canadian astronaut out there at that time. There have been more Canadian astronauts since 2019, if you can believe it. But anyway, I was talking to everybody who was out there at that time and uh, Dave kindly offered to do the foreword for my book and so that sparked a conversation right because you had some ideas rattling around Dave and we had a good discussion about which ones were best and so maybe you want to take it about how we came to this book out of the group yeah, you know, I, it's collaboration, and it's the same collaboration that we used to build the International Space Station, working together, sharing ideas. So when Elizabeth and I first started talking, we said, well, which books should we write? And Elizabeth really wanted to do one on space medicine, which was also on my agenda, but I really wanted to do one on leadership. So we were able to do hmm. the leadership book first, and then we did the space medicine book second. And it's just been a lot of fun bringing all these uh, really exciting stories from space to everyone. Wow, wow. And it's, this is just a fabulous book. Just every every couple of pages, I'm just like, wow, this is this is so interesting. Yeah. And um, so I'm curious now, there's a huge difference between theory and practice quite often. <laughs> and I imagine no matter how much you train to be an astronaut, how much you train in medicine, some what 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 took you by surprise the most when you actually reached space, Dave? What, is there anything that just made you think like, wow, I was just, this is really, this is really real now. You know, as an astronaut, just simply being in space, you experience how your body adapts to that unique environment. So you feel your face getting puffy, you get a low-grade headache when you first arrive in space, your nose is congested. But as a physician astronaut, you understand why all of this is taking place. And you can also begin to predict some of the changes that you're going to see in space. So in terms of uh, the absence of gravity, we understand that we're going to be taller in space just simply by virtue of the fact that you don't have gravity compressing the bones in your back. I didn't anticipate at all that I would be basically be six feet one inch. In space, I was six, two and three quarters. It was unbelievable. But these are all the different changes that take place in your body. And it's really interesting getting a chance to both understand them and experience them firsthand. I bet. I bet. And Elizabeth, what did you find most interesting when you're when you're writing the book? What what, what gave you the biggest ooh-ah factor? The ooh-ah factor really comes down to how you get teams working together to solve complex problems in space, because we've been talking about a few of those things over the years. One of my favorite examples, I think, was how we figured out how to do better weightlifting, so to speak, on the International Space Station. There were two devices, two main devices that have been used, and so without getting too complicated, the first one was a little bit less powerful than the second. And so they found that when they put the second one in, that the outcomes of the astronauts in terms of their health really began to change for the better. Their bones and their muscles were a little bit strengthened when they were able to come back to Earth. And so that was something that people have been trying to solve for years. And it really does show the benefit of having an orbiting laboratory up there for 20 plus years and for having so many astronauts there because you can track things. You can start to make changes. You can start to make good changes that are going to be allowing people to have better outcomes both in orbit and then take that research and bring it back to Earth. Hmm. Hmm. And I'd love to get views from either of you on this. You know, one of the biggest challenges we're, we're going to face as we head out and spend more, put more people in space for longer periods of time, especially beyond the Earth, 
is um, it's going to be ionizing radiation. You know, a lot of there's a lot of radiation out there that we're protected from here on Earth. So what are we what are we learning about the challenges we face from that and how we how we deal with that? Well, we've been we've had humans permanently in space on the International Space Station since 20 the year 2000. So basically the last 22 years and we've been able to characterize and understand that radiation environment. However, going back to the moon and going on to Mars is a totally different story. You're going beyond the Van Allen belts, the degree of radiation exposure is going to be greater. So in terms of the early lunar missions, part of this will be understanding the radiation environment, ensuring that we develop the appropriate shielding to be able to protect the crew members when they're uh, in a lunar habitat or on the Lunar Gateway Space Station. But more importantly, as we think about sending humans to Mars, figuring out how we can reduce the overall radiation exposure by developing the next generation of spacecraft that will get you there faster. We will incorporate shielding into those spacecraft. There are questions about biological countermeasures against radiation and things. So it's a multifaceted approach that we're using to understand this complex problem. In addition to the Artemis 1 mission, there are going to be several mannequins that are going to be sort of tasked on our behalf with, for learning about more about radiation that's near the moon. And so uh, their names are Zelga, um, sorry, Helga, Zohar, and uh, Campos. And so those three mannequins on our behalf are going to be out there. And um, one of them is actually going to be equipped with a special vest to be trying to maybe blunt a bit the effects of the radiation to see how that goes. The other ones will not. And so there will be a lot of sensors, radiation sensors, acceleration sensors, and other sensors to be really understanding the effects on the human body um, while they're out there. And it's also a youth experiment. There's a Canadian on board, so to speak, with the research with that experiment too, that's going to be looking at living things out in the lunar orbit for the very first time. We've never done that besides on humans. And so there's a lot of exciting research, even in that one mission, which will then build, as Dave was saying, into future moon missions and even to Mars. Hmm. You know, one of the interesting things is the space program takes science fiction or what used to be science fiction and turns it into science fact. And, you know, you think about a lot of the technologies that we're using in space right now in low Earth orbit. And 20, 30, 40 years ago, we would consider those science fiction based. And as we look forward to the future, I wonder which of those technologies that today we think of as science fiction will become science fact in the future? What's the enabling research that will be critical to helping us uh, understand how to get there faster, to travel farther in our own solar system and to live on other planets? It's a really exciting opportunity for young investigators and engineers to be able to go forward and study these problems. Hmm. And so what, is, what are some of these problems that you would most like to see investigating? Well, I think faster spacecraft. You know, if you think about the distances that are involved, even within our own solar system, going to the moon is going to be three days, but certainly going to Mars, it's going to be a significant challenge, roughly six months to get there. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you go farther out in the solar system, the transit times are just, they're huge with today's propulsion technology. So figuring out how we can get there faster would be uh, really exciting. And we touch on this in the book as well. Maybe you can sleep your way to Mars by hibernating mm. and what are those alternative approaches that we can have to keep the crew healthy while they're on uh, en route to get there. Hmm. Exactly. And there's also other forms of propulsion that are being studied right now. I mean, NASA, among many other government agencies, is looking at nuclear propulsion as just one example. But there are many other ways that we might be able to get there faster. We have a lot of smart engineers that are thinking about this. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's the ultimate solution, just to say, you know what, that, you know, year round trip might be a little bit too long. Let's try and think of another way to get there faster and get back faster to be reducing the amount of radiation and other risks that you face during that time. Hmm. And um, so we've talked a little, we've talked quite a bit here about some of the health hazards and some of the reasons we, um, some of the concerns we need to be aware of. But we have a viewer question, which comes from, which asks the exact opposite question. Wade from Bozeman, Montana would like to know, would space travel uh, cause his chronic back and neck pain to go away? <laughs> More generally, are there health conditions that affect people on Earth that maybe become better? Maybe, you know, 
symptoms may be relieved by going in this space. Wade has a question that's shared by many individuals. <laughs> and in fact, a back pain is an interesting one to think about because, of course, when you go to space, you don't grow taller. You essentially become taller because the, the space between the bones in your back, the vertebrae, is widening. So if you have compression of discs that's causing pain in your back on Earth, maybe that's going to go away when you're in space, you know, with that gravitational offloading. The challenge, of course, when you go to space, you become taller your discs are offloaded that's all great some people feel that stretching in their back causes them a little bit of pain as well and more importantly when you come back to earth everything compresses back down so that's the time that if you have a vulnerable disc in your back you're going to find out about it but it's a great question <laughs> <laughs> you know, it might the benefits for mental health too um you yeah. know i have orbit very seriously obviously we more david to speak to that but there is something out there that's called the overview effect and that's how people feel when they're out um above earth able to look at a planet without any sort of artificial borders that we're so used to but even from the perspective of somebody who's been suddenly um, sadly grounded for the time being i'm able to participate in that through so many other means right because i as a journalist and other people who are working in analog astronaut uh, habitats or other people who might be working in mission control or even artists there are many ways that people can be participating in the space community and just by getting a sense of the overview effect through teamwork through international collaboration it really does help whenever things are a little bit tougher to be sort of leaning into that community and thinking about all the more people that are really making a difference in that way. So I'd like for both of you, just to briefly, if you can, speculate on how uh, space travel and living in space could change the human race. Elizabeth, do you want to start? <laughs> you know, I don't know about changing the human race because that would take many, many millennia, you know, at the very least, probably, unless there's some sort of an artificial, you know, acceleration involved in it. But I think what's going to be really interesting in the shorter term is the number of types of people who are going to be able to fly up there. One of the favorite uh, missions recently that I like to cite that's a little bit off the NASA track is something called Inspiration4. And so that was an all civilian mission that was going to be flying that flew in 2021. And it had people up there such as the first pediatric cancer survivor up there in space. And she also had the first prosthetic limb. And so that really showed the potential of being able to fly different kinds of individuals up there. I know that also the European Space Agency is looking at opening up its astronaut cadre to people with disabilities. And um, also Axiom Space. I don't want to be uh, speaking too much about that because Dave the one who was involved with the first mission. But Dave, maybe you could talk a bit about commercial space with Axiom. Yeah, there are tremendous opportunities for the future. You know, I am, I may get a chance to go fly in space again as a private That'd astronaut. Great. All three of us may get a chance to go and fly in space on some new commercial spacecraft in the next 20 or 30 years. So it's really opening up. I think one of the things that's exciting to consider is that this millennium will be the millennium in which the human species becomes a spacefaring species. Right. I first flew in space in the last millennium. I did my second space flight in this millennium and it, it's really interesting to think about the possibilities of what's going to take place as we go back to the moon we're going to understand how to live on other bodies in our solar system when we go to mars we'll understand how to live and work on another planet in our solar system and over time i wouldn't be at all surprised to see the first human born on the surface of another planet so this will be a human, but they're born on Mars. And how's that all going to work? Are we going to call them an Earthling or a Martian? Or what are we going to call them? But all of these things are very interesting items that arguably we might think of as science fiction right now. They will become science fact over the next uh, century, maybe two, three centuries. But certainly within this millennium, we'll see humans on other planets in our solar system. That's fabulous. Well, thank you so much to both of you for being on the show. It was, it was wonderful talking with you. Oh, it's our pleasure. Thanks for having us. For sure. Thanks for having us on board. Yeah. And that was uh, Dave Williams and Elizabeth Howell, authors of Why Am I Taller, coming out on the 1st of November. Check it out anywhere you get your books. One of the great challenges we face as humanity moves out towards the stars is the threat of radiation, especially galactic 
cosmic radiation. The Van Allen Belt's powerful magnetic bands of charged particles surrounding our planet protect us here on Earth. But traveling beyond that protective layer could prove hazardous over time. Now, the walls of spacecraft can provide some protection for spacefarers, sure, sure. Yet, walls cannot protect against all forms of radiation, and over time, this exposure can raise, raise the risk of cancer for space travelers. Bringing explorers to Mars would mean several years and a harsh exposure to various forms of radiation. Uh, there are also nutritional issues to be aware of in space. Beyond our world, explorers need additional calcium as well as vitamin D, which is normally provided by sunlight reaching us here on Earth. Now, one mineral spacefarers have an abundance of is iron. With less gravity than on Earth, the human body reduces the amount of red blood cells in the bloodstream. The excess iron is contained in these cells is stored in the liver, where it can cause health problems. Drinking enough water is vital on Earth and even more important in space. Therefore, living a healthy lifestyle in space means drinking a lot of water. Now, those of us who already live in the desert are already doing this seriously. You can't go to the corner store here without a bottle of water. Next week, for the 27th of September, we're going to be on vacation, so there's not going to be a new episode. Totally feel free to watch the older shows, though. They're fun, right? I mean, you can't have seen them all, right? Have you? Have you? That'd be cool. On the following Tuesday, the 4th of October, we're going to be talking about making space sustainable. We'll be talking with Daniel Fox, CEO and co-founder of Morpheus Space. So make sure to join us then. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, follow, share, and share the Cosmic Companion all over your usual social media networks. Find a new one. Why not? Can it hurt? Clear skies. Thank you.